Hey, welcome back to Grace Community's Virtual Church. If you're anything like me, you have tried year after year, day after day, struggling through all of the Word of God and struggling through all the different things that I encounter on a daily basis, seeking to create in myself the fruit of the Spirit, and I cannot do it. I cannot create in myself the fruit of the Spirit of God. And what we find today as we dig into Galatians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 16, going to the end of the chapter, is what we find is that you are incapable of creating in yourself the fruit of the Spirit. You don't have the power to do that. Only the Spirit of God does. And only by walking in step with the Spirit do I ever make my way back to following after the Spirit of God. So if you would, go ahead and join me uh, as we watch the sermon here on Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. And it's a good time to be here, good time to have you back. We'll be in Galatians chapter 5 again, so if you have your Bible on you or with you, open that up, Galatians 5. Um, we should be finishing the chapter today. Then uh, if everything goes well, we'll finish the chapter. If you don't have one with you or at all. There's a red hardback one in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and grab that and we'll uh, dive into Galatians 5. If you don't own a Bible, keep that from us to you. Just a little gift from us. So uh, we're going to dive into, uh, further into the idea of what do we do with the freedom that we have in Christ. So last week we talked about the, the freedom that we have in Christ should not be squandered and used on ourselves. We shouldn't be selfish with the freedoms Christ has given us, but rather that we should use our freedom to serve other people, that we should use our freedom in service to others. And, and if I'm using my freedom to gain for myself, if I'm using it in selfishness, what will happen is I will become consumed. Um, now, and, and we see that today pretty clearly. Uh, you saw um, people who used their freedom to protest as a way to consume and to get things for themselves. Is that, isn't that the truth? We saw that. We're seeing that happen in real time today. We have seen uh, people consumed by fear. And what happens is we run back to slavery and we enslave ourselves to... Uh, to our fear, we enslave ourselves to our selfishness, we use our freedom to run back to slavery, which is a crazy thing to think that we are set free and yet choose to be slaves. And we end up becoming consumed by the thing that we think will satisfy us. But it, deep down in our hearts, the part that we don't listen to, but we probably should, you know what I'm talking about? So deep down in our hearts, we, uh, we know that thing will never satisfy us, but we still seek after it anyway, don't we? So uh, that was what we kind of dove into last week. We dove into the motivation that if I'm motivated by love, then I will seek to give of myself to other people. But if I'm motivated by selfishness, if I'm motivated by fear, I'll be consumed by that and destroyed and devoured by that thing because we were made, we were created to live sacrificially, to give of ourselves to other people. And the Holy Spirit will lead us into giving and living sacrificially. So as we continue to work on the idea of what it means to be free in Christ, uh, Paul's going to take us into the next step. So you're set free to serve, but you're also set free to live by the Spirit. And this is something that is I think, one of the more timely messages of today because Satan, our great adversary, has found it very convenient to fool you into thinking you're living by the Spirit when in reality you're following after your flesh. And he can make it look like you're living by the Spirit when you're actually walking in the flesh. So Paul, in, as an answer to the question of what good is freedom or what, what do we do with that, and in Galatians uh, 5, 1, we saw Paul say, For freedom Christ has set you free, so stand firm therefore and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, that we've been set free by Jesus for freedom. right? And that freedom now comes with some privilege, and some responsibility, that we're go we are to carry that gift of freedom well. And last week we talked about service, but this week we are responsible. We have the privilege and the responsibility to follow after 
the Spirit of God. So that brings me into Galatians 5, and we're kicking it off in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So once again, we see Paul answering that question. What are we to do with our freedom? What do we do with that? And so the verse I just quoted to you, 5.1. Uh, Isaac's going to throw that up on the screen for us. For freedom did Christ set us free. Stand therefore and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. So once again, we're going to seek to run after, seek to chase down slavery even in the midst of our freedom. And, do, and Paul is encouraging us not to run back to slavery. So when I talk about being walking by the flesh or walking by the Spirit, the Spirit of God will lead you into greater and greater freedoms, all the while the flesh will seek to lead you into greater and greater slavery. And so what we have to do is seek to put to death the flesh so that the Spirit of God can reign in our hearts. Amen? All right? Yeah. We want to put the death the flesh to death. Listen, they are enemies of each other. They cannot coexist. You cannot be walking in the flesh and be led by the Spirit at the same time. It doesn't work. They are at war with each other. In fact, the Spirit of God is at war with the flesh in which He resides. So you, you cannot walk by the flesh and be following the Spirit at the exact same time. It's not like Frankenstein's monster and you can just sew the two together. Like It doesn't work. They're at war with each other. So what we need to do is put our, our flesh to death so that we can be a follower of Christ. Now, if you are not a follower of Christ here, if you're sitting here and you are not a follower of Jesus, you are a slave to your sin. You're, a, you're in, enslaved by that. Now, I know what, if, if you're not a follower of Christ, you may be sitting here thinking, no, I'm not. You're the one that's enslaved to this book. You have to follow Jesus. I don't have to follow anything. Well, that's simply not true. Because when sin calls to you, you have to answer that. When sin reaches out to you, when sin desires something, you have to answer that. You are enslaved by your sin. You will choose sin every single time it shows up. And, and that's what happens when we live in the flesh. The, you know, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, some of the most moral people on the planet, right? You've met them. Like, they live their lives in extreme morality and yet are slaves to sin. And yet are enslaved by their sin, even though it, it looks, it has this moral exterior, I live a good life. They're enslaved to that. They're enslaved by their sin. So even if they look good on the outside, they're still enslaved to sin. And that's why Paul kept pushing this and, and driving this idea home of, of that the law does not justify you because it will enslave you. You will seek to modify your behavior to match the law and you will become a slave to that. And that is not what Jesus has called you to. And without Christ, we are all living according to the flesh. We're not free from that. We have to obey its desires. You're still a slave. Even if there's an, an external morality, you are still a slave to sin. Um, there's there's a, an argument that's, that's pretty logical, and it's gaining a lot of steam if you look at it, that the number one religion in America is no longer Christianity. That at this point, it's something called moralistic therapeutic deism. That... Uh, moralistic therapeutic deism means if I live a good life that there's probably a God, he probably cares about me, he wants to be involved in my life just when things go bad, but if I just am pretty good, then I can move my way in right living and I can better myself and I can be more like, uh, I, I, and I can gain the acceptance of God because I've lived a good life. Moral, moralistic, therapeutic deism that I, I just need to make myself better. That's why the best, the self-help section is like the biggest section of any bookstore, right? 
hundreds of thousands of books written on the subject of self-help because morali mor moralistic therapeutic deism has told us that we need to live, and it's crept into our churches, right? That we, that, and, and that's where the prosperity gospel has sprung up out of, right? Uh, so I am not, I think it's a decent movie, but I don't really like Frozen 2. Anyone here a Frozen 2 fan? You're like, oh, I love that movie. It's so cute. Yeah. So uh, at the end, the one girl, the, the one girl that has a name, I can't think of it. What's the princess's name or the... Elsa, yeah. So she's, um, I don't, I, my daughter's in love with it, but I don't know why I forget her name. But anyway, so at the end of the movie, Elsa's like in this big ice cave and she's singing to herself about how she's the, huh? She's not Elsa. I am the one I've been searching for all of my life. Right? You are the one you've been searching for all your life, right? And she's talking about how she is the fulfillment of all things and she's the one that's going to make her happy and she's the one that's going to satisfy everything. That is bull crap. <laughs> it's garbage. You are not the one that's going to satisfy you. If you could, you'd have done it by now. It's garbage. And we're teaching that to our little girls. I'm the one I've been waiting for. No, you're not. <laughs> Jesus is the one you're waiting for. Jesus is the one that's going to make wholeness come into your life. He's the one that's going to fulfill the desires of your heart. It's not you, right? If it could be you, you'd have done it by now, right? That's, a, that's not even in my notes. That's a side thing about how much I hate Frozen 2 because I'm, I don't, like this is moralistic therapeutic deism. You can better yourself and become a best version of you and gain the acceptance of God, right? And this is creeping its way into our churches and, it's, and it, it makes war against the Spirit of God. But let's look at what the works of the flesh are. Let's look at what the you are the one you've been waiting for, what that manifests in your heart. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, and as I warned you before, that, you, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what your flesh is going to chase down. This is what your flesh is going to naturally gravitate towards. These are the things that will come out in your life. Even if you have that moral exterior, your heart is still far from the Lord, isn't it? Even if you're able to somehow put together a lifestyle that's moral and upright and lives according to what uh, the commands of the Lord, you're still going to fail, right? So... James 2.10, uh, he echoes what Paul said here. He said, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So you might say, and you might be sitting there thinking, Well, I'm not really sexually immoral. I've never done that. I'm, I'm not, uh, I've never been drunk. I've never been in an orgy. I didn't even know what that was. I had to look it up on my phone when you said it, right? Yeah, you, know, you, you might be sitting here thinking, like, I don't, I've never engaged in these things. But let me ask you, have you ever, like, desired something that belonged to somebody else? Because like, that's envy, right? Have you, have you ever been angry? Have you been angry today? Right? Have you ever uh, been jealous? Because if you have, then you are also guilty of drunkenness and sexual immorality and idolatry and all the things, the enmity and strife. You're guilty of all of it. If you, the law comes as one piece. You obey the whole law or you are guilty of the whole law. We don't get to pick and choose what we want to obey. We either obey the whole of it or we don't obey any of it and we're guilty of all of it. And without the Holy Spirit actively leading our lives, our hearts will naturally gravitate towards sin. It will naturally go this direction. So uh, you might be that person sitting there thinking like, I, I'm, I'm not that bad of a person. And typically that person that says, I'm not that bad, I'm a pretty good person, is also the one that their family can't stand because they just bring division with them. Right? 
And that's what happens when we let the flesh walk in our lives and we walk by the flesh is we will sow division everywhere we go. Everything we do produces fruit. So we're about to dive into the fruit of the Spirit. But the list we just read was the fruit of the flesh. Right? So let's look through that one more time. Uh, the fruit of the flesh or, or the yeah, the fruit of the flesh is this, sexual immorality, impurity, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissension, division, envy, drunk. Like these are the things. This is the fruit of the flesh. This is what it's going to produce in your life. Everything you do produces fruit. Like as far as I know, plants don't think about what they're going to grow. Like, I wonder where I'm going to grow today. I, I'm, I, I don't know what plants think about, but I'm pretty sure it's not what they're going to grow, right? I don't have a tomato plant. I just planted my garden. I don't have a tomato plant up there thinking like, I'm going to put a prune out. Just see what happens, right? It's not what he's up there thinking. You know what it's going to do? It's going to grow a tomato eight days a week because it's a tomato plant, right? And that's what it does. It's, it's nature, and it produces fruit. Everything you do will produce fruit fruit in your life. So what's coming out of your nature? If you're walking by the flesh, you will produce the fruit of the flesh. If you're walking by the Spirit, you'll produce the fruit of the Spirit. And those who are seeking to live this morality of their own and are seeking to live out the, their own morality and chase down Jesus Christ, listen, you're going to produce the fruit of the flesh. Because when you walk by the flesh, you'll produce the fruit of the flesh. Does that make sense? Yeah? All right. I'm going to move on. Now, um, I want to put this idea in your mind so that I, I, I'm trying to correct some theology. Okay? For a very long time, I believed, just because of my upbringing in church, I grew up in church, that the Holy Spirit was a defense against my flesh and a defense against the world, right? Does that make sense? Anyone else here kind of felt like the Holy Spirit defends me? He stands as a defense? I never saw the Holy Spirit as an offensive weapon, as one who would fight on my behalf, who would go and do battle against my flesh for me. Does that make sense? I, I just never really saw him that way. So think about the Holy Spirit as a as someone who will seek to fight against your flesh if you will follow him. And he will make war, he will do offense against the flesh that is, that he, in which he resides. And he will create in you godly character. So let's read the fruit of the Spirit and see what if we live, if we walk by the Spirit, what will naturally be produced in our lives. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So uh, love, so first one was love. It's first for a reason because it's uh, 1 John 4, 8 actually tells us that God is love. So when we, ex when we have love produced in our lives, we are actually imitating the very character of God. That God is love and we can become like the Lord when we allow love to reign in our lives. So he put love first because love most clearly mirrors the Lord. The second one, and I think he puts joy second, and I think that matters uh, because uh, <laughs> joy is probably the most visible fruit of the Spirit. If someone is living in joy, you're like, that person's got something I don't, Right? Especially if you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart. That joy is just something that you can't shake. That you can see it coming a mile off. Like people that are joyful are attractive people, aren't they? You want to be around a joyful person, right? And all that our world has, all our flesh can create is happiness. We are not strong enough to produce love. We are not strong enough to produce joy in our lives. Our flesh, we can't do that. All we can create is happiness, which is an empty shell that can be taken away from us with a phone call, can it? Like to, right now, your phone could ring and all happiness is gone. Isn't that the truth? 
happiness is fragile. Joy is pretty permanent. You do not shake joy, right? So uh, we don't have the power to create these things in ourselves. Actually, we don't have the power to create any of the fruit of the Spirit in our hearts. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We do not have the power to create those things in our own hearts. We can't do it. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. That is the fruit of the Spirit. He creates those things in you. You can't do it on your own. But what I can create, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, right? Those things, the fruit of the flesh, I can make those. But I can't produce the fruit of the Spirit in my own life. If I'm going to see those things, it must come from the power of the Spirit of God that I'm following. When I submit my heart to the Spirit of God, He will create those things in me. So let's talk a little bit about how we are led by the Spirit. How to because I could end it here and do you no good. Right? Walk by the Spirit. Good luck. Right? Just get out. Right? I could do that. But let's talk about how we walk by the Spirit. So first of all, first thing I think we need to understand, and probably a pretty important one, the Spirit of God will not work on external behaviors. He always works on the heart. The Spirit of God does not work on those external things. He always works on our hearts. Because it's easy for me to point to the external problem and say, Holy Spirit, go get it, and all the while keep my heart far from Him. And then when, when the behavior persists, I say, well, the Holy Spirit, I just don't know what's going on. It's His fault. I told Him to go get it. Right? That we think that if I can just fix the external, then that will fix the problem. The Holy Spirit wants to address our heart. So it's easy for me to say, well, I need to work on anger. Well, I need, I, we, I'm working with the Spirit of God. We need to work on this porn issue. Well, I need to stop gossiping. I know like, uh, the Spirit of God is working on that. It's easy for me to point to the external and say the Spirit of God needs to work on those things instead of saying He needs to fix the pride, the lust, and the greed and, and the self-righteousness that is built up in my heart. Because I don't want Him to work on my heart. That hurts. That's hard. But the Holy Spirit is, is, a, is a heart worker. That's where He's going to focus His energy. The Holy Spirit works on our hearts. It's an inside-out transformation, not an outside-in. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to work on our hearts, He will change the behavior. He will fix the, those externals. Now, I'm not saying it's unwise to put up walls and gates and, and, and to say, like, I need to put up a filter on my computer so I don't look at images I shouldn't look at, right? I'm not saying that's unwise until you get the heart under control. I'm saying if you try and work on the external and never address the heart, you're not addressing the problem. You're treating symptoms, not the disease. The Holy Spirit is a heart worker, and He will work in your heart. And once again, like, listen, the waters of your heart are murky, and they are impossible to navigate, right? Have you ever done, like, just think for a minute. Have you ever done something, and in the moment, you had the most pure intentions? And then, like, a few years later, you look back, and you're like, I was being kind of shady. I was not being pure. I was not acting right. Have you ever been there? You, like, you look back and you think, I probably wasn't the most pure motives. The waters of your heart are murky, and they're hard for you to navigate. You need the Spirit of God to lead you. And without Him, we will make mistakes. But with Him, He will create in you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control give you a real-time example of this. Um, so I'm just going to kind of admit something to you that's, uh, you know, not ashamed of it, but I've been going to a counselor uh, for, well, since what, November, probably? Um, for a while, I've been going to see a Christian counselor um, because I had some, like, anger and just junk in my heart that I, uh, I couldn't disciple out on my own. Like, I was just short with my kids and um, and just was easily angered, and then I just thought, this isn't good. So I'm, I, I did my best to disciple that out of my own heart, so I need to confess that to you and seek your forgiveness because I stood on this stage and told you, you need a person discipling you, then I refused to do that when I had something in my heart. So please forgive me for that. Um, 
but I, I started seeing a Christian counselor, and I just sat down in his office and said, I need this discipled out of me. I can't do it. And he said, all right, well, let's get to work. So guess where he started? Not on the anger. He didn't start there. He started on something else. And he started working in my heart, and he unburdened my heart for some junk from my childhood that I didn't need to be carrying around. And I have, like, I asked my wife the other night, like, have you seen a difference? And she's like, yeah, quite a bit, actually. Because from what I once was, and I'm not there yet, but, like, to where I am now, it's like supernatural difference because I allowed the Holy Spirit to work on my heart. And he took the burdens away, and he cleaned up the garbage that needed, that was causing the behavior to come out. Does that make sense? And when I just worked on the behavior, I couldn't get there. But when we started working on the heart, it solved the behavior. Well, starting to solve the behavior. There's still days where I'm like, why are you four? But like, that, that's, they're getting fewer and far between, you know? <laughs> like, so anyway, it's easy for us to point at the external and then blame God when I can't fix it. Isn't it? So that's the first one. Let the Holy Spirit work on your heart. Let Him engage the heart and let Him lead you into freedom. The second way that we can follow and be led by the Spirit is just watch the fruit. So when you open your Bible and you look at Galatians chapter 5, you look at verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is that singular or plural? Singular, great. You guys are teaching your kids. They're, they're looking so successful. I'm so proud. Of it. Did anyone here say plural? Would anyone be willing to say like, oh yeah, that's a plural. You know, no, it's singular. It doesn't say fruits. It says fruit, which means if you have one, you're going to have them all, doesn't it? That they're, they're a package deal. They're all coming together. So if you're going to have one, you're going to have all of them. So if you see yourself Oh, I'm growing in patience, but my, I'm not doing very well in peace. Then let me challenge you that you're walking in the flesh and you're trying to get the fruit of the Spirit on your own because if the Spirit of God is working in your heart, all of these things will be there and increasing. All right? Watch the fruit. Be aware of what there is. So you can, if you can see one growing, you should be able to see them all growing. If you're following the Spirit, He will produce in things in you that only He can produce. We cannot do these things on our own. And finally, and this is the hard one, follow the Spirit of God into places only He can take you. Follow the Spirit into only places that He can take you. If you're going to learn to follow the Spirit, if you're going to learn the voice of your shepherd, you need to follow Him into places that, he can, that only He can lead. Right? Too many of us, uh, I, think, I think a lot of people feel like they, that this one hour is God's and the other 167 this week are mine. And, and we aren't giving Jesus everything. We aren't following Him with everything, every part of our lives. We aren't learning to follow. How can you learn His voice on one hour a week? You need to follow Him into places only He can lead. Be the person who wants to see Jesus as their Lord and Savior of their whole life. Let the Spirit show up in ways that you are afraid to let Him show up. So, uh, let me just kind of make it real. Like, are you telling your coworkers about Jesus? And if something rose up in your heart that was like, oh, can't do that, then let me just challenge you that maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now saying that you're embarrassed of Jesus. That you're embarrassed to share Jesus with them. Follow him into spaces that you're afraid to go. Maybe you're the one in the church that needs to see everyone. I want to see other people grow in their faith. And you're, you're sitting there thinking, I can't do that. I don't have it all together. Well, that maybe that's the Holy Spirit right now fighting against self-righteousness. That you're trying to do it all on your own. And he's making war against your flesh even now, like, I could keep going. Like, be, the, be the leader in your home. Lead your family in uh, family devotion. Be like, oh, it's going to be awkward. Yeah, it's going to be awkward, right? We, we, when I try and, like, just this week I started trying to do devotions with my wife. It's awkward. And I'm a pastor, right? So it's going to be awkward, but be the leader in your home. Be the one who follows the Holy Spirit in letting him unburden your heart.
and remove from you the things that need removed. Maybe the one who needs to give with greater generosity and you're, you're sitting here thinking, I can't do that. Our ends barely meet now. Well, then let me challenge you that the Holy Spirit's telling you that maybe you don't trust Him with your, with your finances. Have the courage to follow the Spirit of God into places that only He can lead. So if you're struggling with letting go and if you're, your heart is hard and you, and you think, I'm doing just fine. I don't need the Lord. I'm doing just fine the way I am. Like, and if that's where you are. You're walking in the flesh. And you're not walking in the Spirit. The Spirit of God will lead you into greater depth and into greater understanding and a greater reflection of God. He will produce this fruit of the Spirit in you. So as I read through the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, if there's one of those things that do not exist in your life, the altar is open. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to take some time and just help you step out of walking in your flesh. Because as, as I said at the beginning, Satan has done a very good job of making it seem like I'm walking in the Spirit when I'm actually walking in the flesh. And he makes it look like I'm following the Spirit, even though I'm not. And that's where we get caught in that moralistic, therapeutic deism where we think that I'm doing pretty good because, look, my life is good. It's pretty good. Right? I'm improving. I'm, I'm making moves. So I'm doing fine. When in reality, we're walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit. And at that point, you're not free anymore. You're a slave again. So as Amy comes, I'm going to pray for us real quick, and, and the band's going to come up. But um, would you stand, and we will um, we'll pray together, pray together on our feet. So, so there it is, walking in step with the Spirit of God, walking in step with Him, so that you and I can find ourselves in a greater level, and a greater depth, and a greater knowledge of who Jesus is, what Jesus is doing and how he's changing the world. And this is just a uh, this this is just an introduction to walking in step with the spirit. He goes so much deeper and he will take us so much farther if we would just allow him the space to be lord in our lives and to engage with our hearts. So I, I pray this was an encouragement to you. Uh, finally catch the closing to this sermon and enjoy what we have uh, here at the end. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, Holy Spirit, we do ask that you would fall here. That you, that you would come and that you would lead us. Lord, take us by the hand. Lord, grab our hearts and lead us where you want us to go into great joy, into great love, freedom, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, Produce fruit in us that only you can produce. We love you. We are thankful for you, but Lord, we are afraid to follow at times. And I pray you would not let us be enslaved by that, but Lord, that you would help us to follow you. As a man, pray, as a man said to Jesus Christ, Lord, I believe, but help my own belief. Lord, we want to follow, but help our not following. And I pray that we would be a people who worship you with abandon and give you everything that we have. Let's sing.